I mean by the work of her hands, his mother had turned out by her husband, who was a carpenter by trade, on being convicted of adultery with a Roman soldier named Penthria. Being thus driven away by her husband and wandering about in disgrace, she gave birth to Jesus, a bastard. Celsus acknowledges Jesus' birth and existence, but does not accept the concept of a virgin conception. He tries to dismiss Mary's premarital pregnancy as a result of an affair she had with a Roman soldier. Strangely enough, there is a very similar passage in the Jewish Talmud, which makes the same accusation. This gives us reason to believe that Celsus may have referenced Jewish sources for some of his arguments. On the crucifixion, Celsus writes, Jesus accordingly exhibited after his death only the appearance of wounds received on the cross, and was not in reality so wounded as he is described to have been. In this statement, Celsus confirms Jesus' death by crucifixion, although he claims the only wounds Jesus received were those inflicted by the crucifixion, thus denying any previous torture had taken place. But not even history offers Celsus the benefit of the doubt, as floggings were the standard form of torture given to victims prior to the crucifixion. Celsus contradicts himself yet again when he later states that Jesus was probably never even crucified, but instead had an impostor die in his place. Skeptic Interjection 1 Celsus also states, it is clear to me that the writings of the Christians are a lie, and that your fables are not well enough constructed to conceal this monstrous fiction. So how do we know that Celsus is referring to a historical Jesus, and not just debating a myth of Jesus? Answer: Evidence which shows Celsus to be refuting aspects of a historical Jesus is as follows. Number one, satisfied with his presentation of evidence, Celsus offers his conclusion that Jesus was only a man, not a myth or a god, as the apostles had claimed. That's pretty clear that he thought that he existed. Number two, instead of denying the alleged events, Celsus offers alternative theories to the early Christian claims, like the virgin birth being a cover-up for an illeg illegitimate pregnancy, and the miracles actually being the works of sorcery, if he was discussing a mythical character, he would not have needed to go to such lengths, but to merely have dismissed Jesus as a myth. After all, there is no easier way to discredit a religion than to assert its founder never existed. Of course, this is the argument Celsus never makes. Number three. Celsus refers to his belief that the claims such as the virgin birth and the resurrection were embellishments created by Christians, not that Jesus himself was a myth. Celsus was debating the claims of Jesus' divinity, not his existence. Gaius Suetonius Tranquilius lived from 69 to 130 AD. Suetonius was a prominent Roman historian who recorded the lives of Roman Caesars and historical events surrounding their reigns. He served as a court official under Hadrian and as an analyst for the imperial house. Suetonius records the expulsion of Christian Jews from Rome, mentioned in Acts 18 verse 2, and confirms the Christian faith being founded by Christ. He says, As the Jews were making constant disturbances at the instigation of Christus, Claudius expelled them from Rome. Skeptic Interjection 1 because Suetonius misspells Christus as Crestus, is it possible that he was referring to someone else? Answer: Because Crestus was an actual Greek name, critics speculate Suetonius may have been referring to a specific civil agitator. I would like to present a few arguments as to why I feel this is a reference to Jesus. In order to get as close to the author's intent as possible, this is the passage as it exists in the original Latin. Suetonius seems to imply the word Christus as a title, not as a reference to a particular rebel. Though I have seen critics cite the passage as a certain one, Christus, we can see that this is incorrect by the lack of the original quodam in the original Latin. Suetonius uses the word instigation, not instigator. The Latin word referring to an instigator is impulsor but the term referring to an instigation is impulsore. And this is the word Suetonius uses, 
thus affirming the belief that he is using the word Christus as a title and not as a name. It was common for both pagan and Christian authors to spell the name using either an E or an I, and we know that the Christian authors were obviously referring to Jesus when they spelled the name Christus. Tertullian criticizes pagan disdain or hate for Christianity and points out the fact that they can't even spell the name correctly. He implies the common misspelling of Crestius by their use of the term Christians. He writes, Most people so blindly knock their heads against the hatred of the Christian name, it is wrongly pronounced by you as Christians, for you do not even know accurately the name you hate. But the special ground of dislike to the sect is that it bears the name of its founder. Apology chapter 3. Next is Thallus, unknown to 52 AD. Although his works exist only in fragments, Julius Africanus debates Thallus' explanation of the midday darkness which occurred during the Passover of Jesus' crucifixion. Thallus tries to dismiss the darkness as a natural occurrence, a solar eclipse. But Africanus argues, and any astronomer can confirm, a solar eclipse cannot physically occur during a full moon due to the alignment of the planets. Felgen of Tralles, a second century secular historian, also mentions the darkness and tries to dismiss it as a solar eclipse. He also states the event occurred during the time of Tiberius Caesar. This is what was written. On the whole world there pressed a most fearful darkness. The rocks were rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and the other districts were thrown down. The darkness Thallus, in the third book of his history, calls, as appears to me without reason, an eclipse of the sun. For the Hebrews celebrate the Passover on the fourteenth day according to the moon, and the passion of our Savior falls on the day before the Passover. But an eclipse of the sun takes place only when the moon comes under the sun and it cannot happen at any other time. Felgen records that, in the time of Tiberius Caesar, at the full moon, there was an eclipse of the sun from the sixth hour to the ninth, manifestly that one of which we speak. Skeptic Interjection 1. Why doesn't Pliny the Elder or Sinensia mention this event in their writings? Answer. Pliny focused his writings on natural astronomical events that had physical scientific explanations. It is doubtful that he would have found it necessary to record an event of supernatural origin. I can also find no mention of him being in Judea at the time, so it is doubtful he would have mentioned it if he did not witness the events firsthand. Seneca focused his writings on dramas, dialogues, and tragedy. And like Pliny, it is doubtful he was in Judea during this event. Skeptic Interjection 2 Because Thallus's and Phlygen's work exist only in fragments, can their testimonies be considered reliable? Answer. This is something the reader will have to determine on their own. Africanus was an honest, qualified author who did not alter the quotes to serve his own purpose. This is very likely considering what we know about Africanus. Africanus's methods were highly respected by his peers. He was often quoted by other authors. He had even chastised his friend and fellow Christian origin for citing information from a spurious, unreliable source. It also must be noted that Thallus never said this eclipse did not happen, but instead was trying to actually come up with a scientific explanation to the eclipse instead of assigning it to a divine origins. Next is Mara Bar Superian. Mara Bar Superian of Syria penned this letter from prison to his son. What advantage did the Athenians gain from putting Socrates to death? Famine and plague came upon them as a judgment for their crime? What advantage did the men of Samos gain from burning Pythagoras? In a moment their land was covered with sand. What advantage did the Jews gain from executing their wise king? It was just after that that their kingdom was abolished. God justly avenged these three wise men. The Athenians died of hunger, the Samians were overwhelmed by the sea, the Jews, ruined and driven from their land, live in complete dispersion. But Socrates did not die for good, he lived on in the teachings of Plato. Pythagoras did not die for good, he lived on in the statue of Hera. Nor did the wise king die for good, he lived on in the teaching which he had given. Skeptic Interjection 1 How do we know that this passage is in reference to Jesus? 1. He was Jewish. Jesus was a Galilean Jew. 
to, he was executed. Jesus was crucified after the Jews appealed to Pilate to have him crucified.